those who study German Abklärung, or those who study France Leicht and Lumière, and all of this makes us think of light, of Ashraf, of Noor, Allah Nur Samawat Al Arab, and the great Ashrafi philosopher tradition Islam, and Munawwar Al Thal, Munawwar Al Fiqh, and in fact, Tadwir, we can used in Arabic at first when the Enlightenment came to the Arab world. Uh, and that is unbelievable, the transformation, because in our vocabulary even, and going back to the vocabulary of the Quran, uh, light always means contact with God. When the Surah 25, Surah Lord says, God is the life of the heavens and the earth. This is a new way of looking at things which makes reason cut off from God, cut off from revelation, as concepts from anything other than itself, yes. as being the source of light. So that there's already a truncation uh, uh, of reality, of the noetic or epistemological faculty of knowing. That is both the known faculty is truncated and uh, the object is to be known is truncated. The object to be known is a secularized world in which anything non-material sim simply becomes speculation and therefore God and angels, you know, this two centuries from Kant, Western philosophy doesn't seriously to talk about angels anymore. Leibniz was the only exception. In the sense that the universe was emptied of divine agencies. Uh, beings created by God, which are not material, but which are created by God and are conscious, the Muslims or Christians or Jews believe. Then, uh, God himself is sent out, even if you believe in him as the deistic version of some one out there who created the world, nothing to do with the world. And man, man becomes the all-powerful, all-central reality. This gives man a sense of freedom of being his own master, of being his own boss. And again, it was so beautifully expressed in our writing of Shuan, just every time European man lost the paradise, a new earth would open before him. And from an Islamic theological point of view, the devil must always have something to offer us in order to seduce us. So this idea of freedom, which is really a negative freedom, Freedom to fall, freedom of kubut, freedom of descent, creating a society in which in fact it is very difficult to ascend, in which the spiritual path gradually disappears, in which religion becomes marginalized, and so on and so on are all a result of this. Yes, with this came democracy, but democracy is in a very problematic manner when the French Revolution took place and uh, France became the cradle of democracy, the French soldiers were cutting off the ears of Algerians when they were fighting in Algeria and getting one franc for it. Getting one franc for it. If you read the uh, letters of Marshal Nyoti, who was an exceptionally honest and uh, conscientious French general in North Africa, you, you see what's going on. The same civilization based on democracy, you know what is done. It's killed more people than any civilization in the world. Any other civilization. So it's not uh, as simple as that. Yes, uh, it, by sacrificing uh, man's relation to God, he tried to put man in the place of God and talk about the equality and freedom of man. And there are some people who are really sincerely uh, believers in that. In that. But uh, it was not really, because it hit certain truths, the other truths were going to come back. It is not accidental that the most irrational, anti-enlightenment movement in world history took place in Germany, in Nazi Germany. There's nothing more opposed to Immanuel Kant and to Diderot and those people than the ideology of fascism, which is true to the irrational, which is based on the idea of will, of macht, of power. Uh, so uh, we should look at this somewhat more deeply. Uh, democracy is a means of achieving things. It's not an end unto itself. And it depends always on social structures. That's why democracy among the North American Indians in the Navajo Reservation is very different from New York. And if you have a lot of money, democracy is very different than if you're poor. <laughs> Obviously.
obviously. And even in the, here in the United States and in Europe, you're supposed to have complete freedom of expression, but if you cover your face, uh, then you're going to prison. But if across the channel, the wife of the former uh, future king of England covers her face to get married, that's going to right. You see the, the hypocrisy with which we deal. So the situation is very, very complicated. Very, very complicated. To idealize what the French Revolution idealized uh, is not correct. The French Revolution did have some ideas. The American Revolution was even less bloody than the French Revolution. They didn't guilty and then kill all the priests and so forth in America. The American War of Independence, uh, American Revolution, had many things in fact similar to Islam in it even. Uh, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were even reading the Quran. Uh, interesting enough. Uh, but of course, se separation of church and state, and that's, that's something else. But uh, uh, the, to think of, it, of these ideas as being sort of absolute ideas is false. They're ideas that came out of civilization at a particular expense which is secularization of human life. When you talk about civil liberties, you end up with the idea that if you destroy the sacred history of a whole Islamic people, it's perfectly all right, like Salman Rushdie tried to do. But if you insult someone in the street racially, then you go to prison, which is God is not important. The sacred is not important. It's man who is important. You can, in the West, we can curse of Christ all you want. Nothing will happen to you. But it's the, so it's the substitution of the human for the divine. And that worked for a while because it gave man tremendous sense of power. But because we have the Luciferian elements in existence, as Goethe said it's so beautifully, the great German uh, writer in Faust, and he predicted everything that would happen. In a sense, by selling himself to the devil, Faust gained certain freedom but ultimately ended in ruin. And here now we're facing that consequence. We're destroying the environment. We have, had, we have more wars. We're killing more people. We're confronted with catastrophes of various kinds. And it's in this circumstance that people like myself, swimming against the tide, believe that we should go back to first principles should go back to the divine injunctions which God has sent us. And not simply emulate what was going on in 1890 in Cairo, to apply those principles to our present day situation. We traditionalists are not like English uh, in England where Pe Trafalgar Square or Piccadilly Square is a big store called tradition. And you go there to sell all uniforms that British soldiers in India in the 19th century. That's not for us tradition. Tradition is a living reality, a truths which are always living, and it's for us to be able to apply it to our world, the world in which we find ourselves. I think that the Islamic world still has one very great treasure in it, and I shall conclude my discourse with that. And that is, faith is very strong still in the Islamic world. We say there are, there are two billion Christians, one and a half billion Muslims, or that's true. But how do you define Muslim and Christian? If you add the word practicing, there are probably more practicing Muslim than any follow any other religion. The only other religion is Hinduism. There is a very large percentage of people who practice Hinduism. Unfortunately, I will speak as a Muslim, unfortunately Christianity, so there are 50 billion Christians in France, but it goes only 4 billion go to church. Uh, not, in England, only 5% of the people go to church. The great Anglican church with all the beautiful churches all over Great Britain, how many people use it? So uh, it's not a question of numbers. I think as far as the intensity of faith is concerned, Islam is still very much alive, and also Islam has preserved to the state despite everything, despite all of the shoddy thinking that we Muslims have carried out since the 19th century, has preserved an intellectual and spiritual tradition, which is still viable and living. It's not accidental. It's some of the greatest and most profound Western minds and hearts have been attracted to Sufism, to Islamic metaphysics, why Rumi is read more than any English poet, why there are Ibn Arabi societies in almost every city, and this treasure is very important for us Muslims ourselves. I think I will conclude. 
I pray for all those people who are there. I wish you all well. And may God will one day allow me to come to South Africa and visit you all from here. Goodbye. Inshallah. Thank you very much. Inshallah. Uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful pleasure talking to you. Uh, I, I would love, next time, inshallah, if I have a chance, I would love to open up the debate on the gender issues, which is very, um, you know, pertinent and uh, relevant to South Africa. But um, there's enough written in your work to discuss the question of complementarities and all of these things. And many questions have been asked about the power of this treatment, the way in which women in current incarnations of the Sharia are being treated, such as the rape laws in um, Pakistan, laws in Pakistan, such as what happened yeah, in, uh, in Nigeria. Um, all with we, between the two of us, we know, let us say, that these are perversions of the executive. These are, these are really much more cultural expressions uh, cultural than expressions. Uh, the Sharia in one trade. Yes. And, and, and That's why they don't really they don't exist in all Islamic countries. Precisely. Which is Precisely. Uh, 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 whereas the daily prayers or the salat or the zakat or so on and so on are universal in all Islamic countries. Yes. But and mostly culture bound interpretations of the Sharia. That's a long issue we discuss with other time. That's a long issue. And I mean the comparison between contemporary Muslim treatment of women and the classical context, it's, it's, it's obscene. Yes. The, the, that yes. alone. You know, say, and which you have so brilliantly touched on. But I just want to bring our audience's attention to the question of gender, that you have not ignored the question of gender, because it is... No, there's a chapter in the book about yeah, that, I, yes. I, I, my current uh, course on teaching, um, uh, can be found in my UJ series, is gender justice, in fact. So uh, these questions emerge all the time. And the doctrine of form of feminism, first wave, second wave, American feminism, this African feminism now, and the Islamic feminism at its law also managed to get on from. So that's a, a huge discussion. All in all, Professor, it has been an absolute delight for us to talk to you. And I'm sure for our audience to talk to you, they might have a question or two. But I would also just like to, uh, this is the first time that I've really been the construction of your work. Um, at the end, you have a poster in which you deal with the present tendencies and future trends in the Islamic law. And then you've got a four brilliant appendices, um, particularly the one with the philosophy of the present day Islamic world. I have, in fact, uh, downloaded from the University of the University website, I, I downloaded your article on philosophy and the importance of philosophy um, in, in our current times. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the article. What I, all that I'm saying is I want to indicate to our audience here that um, they shouldn't overlook the appendices. Sometimes we read the book and then we leave the appendices as if they are mere appendages, but they are not. <laughs> <laughs> they are really a vital part of the work. And I, I really would well, advise them to read this. Inshallah, inshallah. Thank you very much. I have to go already. Yes. But uh, uh, if there is one question, because I promised to take questions, I will take one question from the I'm floor, I'm and then I really have to go. Um, inshallah. Shukran, shukran. Uh, all right. Can I do <laughs> Who would like to ask the one question? <laughs> Anyone? Okay. Sister? Charlotte? Would you like to ask no, a question? No, no. Would you like anyone else would you like to ask a question? Yes? How do we explain to our children? How? Uh, no, how do we explain dimensions? to our children okay, him, about the Islamophobia? Yes, the show, fantastic question. Because I don't know how to tell them about no, breaking the Muslim Muslim does cover it. Oh, in the book. He covers it in this world. Oh, okay. uh, the, the, the question is, um, yeah. how do we, all these beautiful concepts and ideas that we have done, articulated right now, how, uh, the parent is asking, how do we, how do we communicate these values to our children? But I, I have indicated that it's a brilliant um, section on the on the tarbiyah of the children, the, the difference between ta'ali and the and the tarbiyah, the rabbi and the muallim, and how can we see in fact to do that? But maybe just two seconds, uh, take this in us. Yes, I will just uh, make this point. Nothing influences children as much as how we ourselves are and how we behave ourselves. Which our words are not sufficient. Yes. How we are, our actions are important. If we uh, preach goodness or to be calm to a child and then get angry five minutes later, it will have no effect whatsoever. I think the most important thing Muslim parents can do, especially vis-a-vis -vis their children, is to live as good Muslims. Uh, and uh, ethically, humanly, and also to fill the house as much as possible with works of Islamic art and the child is a reality to 
Islamic God of the Christian is a Christian, I mean, I, I, since there are non-Muslims in the audience. But by and large, what I'm, I'm saying works for, it's true of every religion, uh, that what parents uh, do affects the children much more than what they say. Uh, yes, that's what, that's what, that's the heart of that. All right, as I said, that, that <laughs> I have to tell you. Can, can I just show you the audience that is gathered here? Yeah, I'm not too sure you can see, um, Professor. Yes, yes, I can see them. My salams to all of them. Salam alaikum to all of them. Salam alaikum to all of them. To friends, thank you so much. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Salam alaikum. Thank you so much uh, to the audience. Uh, for those who thought that it was going to be a, uh, a live uh, uh, event with uh, Sayyid Hussain, I have to apologize. Uh, it, it was an oversight in terms of when we sent out the invitation. So please, uh, if you came under that impression, my sincere apologies. But as you can see, this works absolutely brilliantly. Um, the internet connection is really, really great. We've had a number of uh, speakers here. We've, had, we've spoken to uh, Ibrahim Musa, Mara Zayn, Justin Oda, a number of foreign speakers, and it's really, really great. Usually, when the dignities or our, our authors have more time, we need all the time for people to ask questions. We write those questions down, and we actually address it. And if there's full time, you can actually come here and speak directly to, to the author. So it works really, really well. Uh, I thank you for, for, uh, for your time and your patience. If there are any specific questions, you are most welcome to ask uh, our esteemed guest, the uh, Shiraj, uh, questions if you, if you like um, as well, um, uh, informally. I would also um, just like to uh, invite you. Uh, next week, we're having another event, uh, as we mentioned. Professor Marion Katz. She's written the first, uh, probably one of the first uh, academic works on Maulut uh, uh, in Islam. Uh, and it's called uh, Devotional Piety uh, in, in Islam, the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu You're most welcome to, to, to come and attend. Next week and Wednesday uh, at, at 6 p.m. Yes. <laughs> Yes, I will put it on, on Skype. It's definitely by Skype. Definitely by Skype. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll just make a, a short, uh, really short <coughs> closing prayer. <laughs> إن الله ولا يتسلون النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا على سيدنا محمد وعلى سيدنا محمد وصحبه وسلم